One of my fondest memories of learning at U of T is going through primary sources such as the Wei Shu, Luoyang Qie Lan Ji, and Li Dai Ming Hua Ji with Professor Lin. I remember one time Shimu, that's Professor Xinyang Arson, one day made a comment while Professor Lin and the students, we were going through uh, Shi Lao Zhi from Wei Shu, translated by Lian Harris, that one day we grad students uh, could translate uh, that as well. I was in disbelief that we could do it, um, we could do that as well. That's how you feel uh, uh, when you are a grad student, I guess. But now <clears throat> we teach students that the, the flaws of translations of different versions passing the torch from generation to generation. Richard Jiangling, Magna Cum Laude, AB, Princeton University. MA, University of Washington, PhD, Stanford, Professor Emeritus of Chinese Thoughts and Literature, University of Toronto. Professor Lin has published widely and prolifically. His publications include books on the Yuan Poets, Yuan Yunshi, 1980, Chinese Literature, a draft of bibliography in Western European languages, 1980 as well, a guide to Chinese poetry and drama, 1984, the classic of changes, a new translation of the Yi Jing as interpreted by Wang Bi, 1994. Uh, here's a copy I have. <clears throat> then five years later, um, the classic um, of the way and the virtue, a new translation of the Dao De Jing of Laozi as interpreted by Wang Bi. Then uh, this year, Zhuangzi, a new translation of the sayings of Master Zhuang as interpreted by Guo Xiang. I think this is what we are going to hear from Professor Lin. All these three, Shen, San Xuan, Laozi, um, Dao De Jing and Zhuangzi were published by Columbia University Press. Professor Lin is the editor of James Liu, Language, Paradox, Poetics, A Chinese Perspective, published in 1988 by Princeton University. He's the author of more than a hundred articles and book sections on Chinese poetry, poetics, history, thoughts and art. Works in preparation includes an integral translation and a study of Huang Zhongxian, poems of miscellaneous subjects from Japan, which will be published next year with Oxford University Press, and from the studio of Sour Mood, Poetry and Prose of Guan Yingxi, which will be published in 2024 with the Queen Press. He's now, Professor Lin now, is living on Gabriola Island, British Columbia, across the Gulf of Georgia from the city of Vancouver. He's a fellow of the Royal Asiatic Society of British, uh, Great Britain and Ireland, and Ireland. Ladies and gentlemen, Colleagues and friends, please join me in welcoming Professor Richard John Lin. Professor Lin, please. Well, I'm quite grateful uh, for this uh, marvelous introduction from one of my very best students. And I haven't seen Lee Du in, in quite a while, and it's nice to see you at least, you know, in virtual reality here. Uh, thanks to the internet. And I'm grateful also to be, have been asked to uh, participate and uh, contribute to this marvelous uh, conference on, on Buddhism. Um, and I've been um, rethinking a lot of what I'm um, doing uh, with right, uh, in uh, trying to, to um, perhaps tailor some of my remarks 
to um, draw out uh, relationships between Zhuangzi, Taoism in general, and Buddhism in particular. Great. Well, um, there's a lot in this uh, presentation that I can't possibly cover um, orally uh, as we uh, go through the slides. Uh, but this um, I intend to put up at this website that I share with others at researchgate.net. Uh, um, uh, so anyone who wants to check on some of these references and some of these longer passages that are um, shown in the slides can, can always look up this up later. This is a um, kind of a blurb put up by Columbia University Press to uh, promote the book. And um, it's, uh, it describes briefly, you know, the history of how it came about and the general sort of a coverage and, and approach to the translation and the, um, well, the history of how I got started about all of this. It's the third book in a series that, of three books that belong together. They're um, the Zhuangzi, the Laozi, and the uh, Changes. Um, are, are collectively called the, the three Shan, the three the San Shan, uh, arcane classics. And I've settled on the term Shan. Uh, it's often translated mis mystery or dark or uh, obscure, um, esoteric. Uh, I've settled on arcane as I think the most appropriate. Uh, translation, and I'll refer to it again later uh, and, and try to describe what it actually and more particularly means in its context here. And along the way, of course, there are various articles, spin-offs from the book, and these are listed on um, the, um, the page where the, those, the, the bulleted list, the modern Chinese word for humor, for instance, concepts of self, and so forth. So there's, uh, what, eight or nine uh, article length things that all of them are available at that um, research uh, gate uh, website. And um, Guo Xiang is the trans is the uh, commentator, and the whole book is is retranslated from Guo Xiang's point of view, and the entire Guo Xiang commentary is translated along with a retranslation of the base text or the classic text of the Zhuangzi itself. Um, it's a new translation, a new in various ways, uh, new in the sense that no one has ever translated the whole thing before from one particular commentary point of view. Uh, Guo Xiang, uh, uh, mid uh, third century, uh, uh, mid uh, third century to early fourth century, um, uh, is a particular take on the book that not everyone in the later tradition agreed with, and it's, he's a controversial figure. Uh, but nevertheless, the, the book translation itself is an integration of the commentary with the text and the text with the commentary. They both are mutually dependent. You, in effect, understand the one in terms of the other, um, something that has never been done before. And along the way, I make some general remarks about Taoism and what the Tao was, uh, and the highlighted, uh, the slightly blue text there, the Tao is the great prime pattern, an all-inclusive matrix of principles of all existence, and think of the Tao as the cosmic program that runs the universe. Um, the big difference between Guo Xiang's take on Taoist thought and his earlier, um, the earlier people in that tradition, Wang Bi in particular, um, revolves around whether the Tao is intrinsic in things only, in other words, a monistic, materialistic view, the Tao doesn't exist apart from things, or that the Tao is uh, not only intrinsic in everything, it's also transcendent to them. In the West, we have this uh, bifurcation, a very, very clear dichotomy. Um, 
uh, the notions of God, for instance. God is utterly transcendent uh, in the mainstream Judeo-Christian tradition. Um, and many scholars who've approached Chinese thought think of China as a diametrical opposite to this, namely that there is no transcendence, there's only imminence. Well, another group of scholars, myself included, uh, think that it's both, that the Tao is both transcendent and imminent. The reason why it can be seen as transcendent is that in certain thinkers, Wang Bi in particular, whose works precede uh, Guo Xiang and upon which Guo Xiang built his own thought, uh, but which broke with Wang Bi in this particular way, is that he rejected this notion that the Tao is transcendent. But, the, but Wang Bi very clearly said that the Tao existed before heaven and earth, before things. So chronologically, it was before things, therefore it must be transcendent to them. So that's a big difference. And uh, this also helped to clarify one uh, thorny issue that has plagued um, Guo Xiang's studies throughout the history of Chinese thought and right up into the 20th century. Uh, the generation before Guo Xiang, a man named Xiang Xiu lived, and he also wrote a commentary on the Zhuangzi. However, he never published it. And the story goes that on, upon his death, his sons were not interested in continuing his work and that they either sold it to Guo Xiang, what manuscript he had, or that Guo Xiang actually somehow got it, you know, without their permission. Um, and that therefore, Guo Xiang really is a kind of plagiarist. There's a uh, I work on this issue in the in the introduction to great length, and uh, I think I've been able to prove that this is not really true. And one of the big differences, of course, between Xiang Xiu and Guo Xiang, whatever Guo Xiang may have borrowed from Xiang Xiu, is that Wang Bi, or rather uh, Xiang Xiu, belonged in the Wang Bi category. He believed that the Tao was also transcendent as well as imminent and Guo Xiang rejected this notion. So there's a really big difference between the two commentaries. Um, not, it's possible to track down some of the remnants of the Xiang Xiu earlier commentary, uh, but, but it's a very, very thorny issue. And in an appendix to the, this book, by the way, it's more than 800 pages. And in the paperback, it's 35 US dollars. Now that's a bargain. Now I can't guarantee you uh, quality, but I sure can guarantee quantity. You get your money's worth. Um, another thing that I talk that I that, that that's here you can you can refer to later is I talk about the reception of the Zhuangzi in the West. I've been interested in uh, early uh, European Western tra uh, reception of of Chinese thought in the West for quite some time. And I've published a, a very long major article on the reception of the Laozi or Tao Te Ching in the West. It'll be published uh, perhaps by the end, of, not, not this year, but certainly by the middle of next year. It's a Springer book. It's one of the Tao companion volumes. It's edited by Professor Guo, um, uh, 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 Liu Xiaogan, in, uh, who's at uh, uh, the Beijing Shi Foundation. Um, faculty now. He um, uh, has been uh, instrumental in several of the Tao Companions. There is a Tao Companion to the Tao Te Ching now coming out, and my essay will be in there. And um, I deal with uh, a reception uh, in the West and why uh, Europeans were beginning with the uh, late 16th and early 17th century, uh, uh, there was a growing interest in non-European ways of thought and uh, beliefs in God and all sorts of things. And the Zhuangzi entered the Western world in the context of that particular loosening up of the Western tradition. Now, um, this all can be read 
and I think appreciated far better if you just read it on your own sometime. Let's carry on. Now, these are the earlier books that um, uh, are in this tradition. This is the first of the three Xuan arcane classics. The classic of changes, the I Ching, published by Columbia University Press in 1994. Um, and uh, on the cover, there, the, the coins, you know, there are various ways of, of, of casting a, a, hex, a hexagrams. Um, this is one way of doing it by these pseudo coins. They're not really coins for currency. They're used just to um, do the odds and evens to, 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 to uh, formulate uh, the, 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 which hexagram is appropriate at the given moment. Um, and I got those when I was a grad student in Kyoto in 1969. And the classic of the way and virtue of the Tao Te Ching, um, graced by the calligraphy of the major uh, calligrapher in Taiwan, uh, Tong Yangtze or Grace Tong, and it's owned by my good friend Hugh Moss, and it hangs in a beautiful country house in the south of England, in uh, West Sussex. And here is the whole thing hanging on the wall with a, with a brief essay about Lao Tzu and it's Wu Wei, which I translate always as non-purposeful action. It's a key term in Taoism. It's often mistranslated as non-action. No, it doesn't mean that. It means unself-conscious action, spontaneous, unmeditated, unmediated action. Right? which is, in the Taoist system of thought, perfect. If you can think and interact with the world, this is how you do it, through Wu Wei. Now, concerning translations of such early Chinese philosophical texts, and this is ex excerpted from Liu Xiaogan's volume, The Tao Companion to the Philosophy of the Tao Te Ching, and I quote something from Arthur Whaley's translation of the Tao Te Ching, which first was published in 1934 by Alan and Unwin in London. And I think he said something so significant that we ought to spend a few minutes with it. And he said, now scriptures are collections of symbols. Their, their peculiar characteristic is a kind of magical elasticity. The successive generations of believers, they mean things that would be paraphrased in utterly different words, yet they continue to satisfy the wants of mankind. The distinction I wish to make is between translations which set out to discover what such books meant to start with and those which aim only at telling the reader what such a text means to those who use it today. For want of better terms, I call the first sort of translation historical, the second scriptural. I do history the historical type. And all of those works are in effect anchored in the context of their own times. Now, here's uh, the Lao Tzu Dao Te Ching is a, in some ways, the, 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 uh, the work upon which the, the Zhuangzi builds. Uh, in other ways, it's quite different. Um, I don't want to get into that. It's, it's, it's a complicated kind of thing to, to talk about. But think about this. Compare All right, the Zhuangzi to the Lao Tzu Tao Te Ching. Now, do you know that it's the most translated work in the world after the Bible? There are 1,500 versions have appeared, more than 450 into English. However, most are not translations, but literary paraphrases based on previous learned translations. And Western versions generally followed three approaches. Scholarly translation arrived at with linguistic and philological expertise and attention to original textual, philological, religious, and historical context aimed at recovering the original meaning and intent, often with explanatory material, including references to Chinese or Japanese translations and commentaries. Two, scholarly translation arrived by collaboration between a Westerner illiterate in classical literary Chinese and a Chinese or Japanese more or less trained scholar. And thirdly, a translation of a traditional, uh, sorry, 
uh, then comes a translation of a traditional commentary combined with a new translation of the Lao Tzu interpreted in the light of that commentary, the two so integrated that the one shapes the other. That's what I did, okay, with both the I Ching and the Lao Tzu, and now with the Guo Xiang version of the Zhuang Tzu. And the last type, subjective interpretation by Chinese illiterates, and though largely based on non-Chinese traditions of thought, they exploit the work of one or more of the other three approaches. The majority of so-called translations are found here. Caveat emptor, and those of you who don't know Latin, means buyer beware. Now, uh, my good friend, uh, Michael Nylon, who is the um, Sather History Chair at the University of California, Berkeley, um, wrote a blurb uh, for the back of the book. And she said, far too long, the Zhuangzi has been read through a Buddhist lens. And Guo Xiang treated as an aberrant commentator who distorts the Zhuangzi by reading it in political ways. As both parts of this picture are flat wrong, Lin's translation, which reads the Zhuangzi through its first systematic commentary, restores the Zhuangzi to all its inherent political genius and original power. Now, well, a Buddhist lens, what's wrong with that? I mean, here it's a Buddhist conference. I mean, we've got to say something about the relationship between Taoism and Buddhism, and I'm going to get on to that. And it's it's a it's a um, uh, several thoughts that have come to me in the course of listening to the presentations uh, that we've been um, enjoying the last couple of days, and I'll I'll come back to that uh, in a few minutes. Uh, now, Michael, whose father expected a boy but got a girl instead still insisted that she be called Michael, and she has been her whole life. Um, uh, she explained to us that to, to Sonia and I, to Sonia and me, several years ago, and when we met her in Montreal, oh gosh, about 15 years ago, no, 20 years ago, gosh, we're all getting old. Anyway, she is essentially um, interested in early China, that is pre Buddhistic China. Um, she's interested in the, the first seven years of recorded history, the warring states through the Eastern Han. She is a terrific Han Dynasty uh, historian trained by Michael Lowy, among other important Han Dynasty historians, uh, with an emphasis on sociopolitical context, aesthetic theories, and so forth. And um, what particularly seems to have upset her about the Buddhist connection is a series of works uh, that I want to discuss next. Well, Brooke Zipporin has done two books exclusively about the Zhuangzi, and one in particular, the newest Neo-Daoist philosophy, and we're going to discuss what's wrong with the term Neo-Daoism in a moment. Anyway, uh, published in 2003, and then more recently, he brought out the complete writings, but it's not one commentary, it's a collection of interesting commentaries that he uh, intersperses throughout his version of the Zhuangzi. Um, I was gonna do that for the, the Yijing book years ago. Uh, that is, start with the, the earliest important commentaries to the Yijing, namely Wang Bi, and work up Oh, through Su Che, that is Su Dong Po's brother. Oh, and then the, some Ming Dynasty people, and then winding up with Wang Fu Zhi, and, and at toward the end of the uh, uh, Yao Nai. Did you know? It, 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 anyway, I did one commentary with every single uh, one of important. I think there were twelve different commentaries. I had almost three hundred pages for one hexagram. And so you multiply that by 64, what have you got? You've got something bigger than the Encyclopedia Britannica, I suppose. So I abandoned that. That's why I did Wang Bi in the first place. Anyway, uh, Brooke is uh, now uh, at the University of Chicago. He had been at Northwestern University for many years. And um, uh, he, 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 he and I have discussed this uh, stuff quite, off, quite often and in some detail at one point when we both were at UC Berkeley attending a conference together. Um, Brooke keeps saying that 
there are similarities between Zhuangzi and Buddhist thought, in particular Madhyamaka. And he does emphasize the word similar and doesn't, I think, uh, concentrate on it enough. There's a big difference between similarity and same. And this is something that Westerners who lump, you know, Oriental thought together, you know, Zen with Taoism, you know, what, you know, all mixed up together. They, they seem to think that because some, that, that things that resemble each other in some ways, therefore resemble each other in all ways, and therefore are the same. Well, this is a very, you know, fuzzy way of thinking, and it leads to some rather ridiculous and utterly wrong conclusions. Um, I, I'll give uh, Brooks Aporin the benefit of the doubt, and he was he stayed with similarities and didn't slide over or slide down or degenerate into sameness. But there is a lot of similarity between Buddhist thought, especially Madhyamaka uh, tradition in Buddhism, and the Zhuangzi, and in and more than the Zhuangzi, in Taoist philosophical thought in general. We'll come back to that in a moment too. Now, the two earlier translations of the Zhuangzi, which are very popular. Now, Burton Watson's translation uh, first appeared in, what was it, 1965, I think, uh, and has been in print uh, constantly, all the time. Also published by Columbia. Um, there he is. He was a prolific translator, of both uh, prose and poetry. And he worked primarily from uh, often through Japanese translations and Japanese annotated versions and studies of Chinese works. And he knew Japanese extraordinarily well. Um, and he worked very, very fast. I remember one of my teachers, Helmut Wilhelm said years ago, Burton Watson, the court translator of Columbia University. I mean, he was cranking it out, you know, volume after volume. I don't know how many he did in the course of, of the five or six years from the mid 60s or beginning of the 60s through the 70s. Anyway, there it is, the complete works of Zhuangzi. Now, he got most of his um, take on the Zhuangzi from this scholar, he, he, uh, Fukunaga Mitsuji, who brought out in, a, in um, the 1950s through into the early 60s a complete translation of the Zhuangzi. And similarly, but again, not the same, we have my old friend, Victor Mayer, uh, who's been at the University of Pennsylvania his whole career, uh, except from visiting uh, at the University of Hong Kong uh, several years back. Um, Victor uh, did a much, much the same thing, except that instead of uh, Fukunaga Mitsuchi, he, he worked primarily from Ak Akatsuka Kyoshi's version. And here it is. It's, um, and this I found very useful too. Um, I got a copy, uh, friends helped me to get um, uh, a bargain on a very expensive book as part of a large set of works uh, devoted to the translation and study in Japanese of, of, Jap of Chinese philosophical works. It's in two volumes, it's enormous. Um, and it's, and one ironic part of it is that every once in a while he quotes and translates into Japanese, modern Japanese, uh, sections of the Guoxiang commentary. And then right at the end, he'll say, Jigaimas, it's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> now, however, both these Japanese scholars based their own take on the Zhuangzi on this work. This is Lin Shi Yi's Zhuangzi Zhuangzi, Zhuangzi was his uh, studio name. Po Yi means vernacular explication. In other words, it's written in Song Dynasty, thir uh, 13th century vernacular Chinese. This is the same language um, of a lot of Buddhist works written at the same time. And it's also the uh, Zhu Xi's uh, Yulu, his uh, recorded conversations with his disciples. It's, it's one of the earliest 
consistent forms, large collections, large a body of early vernacular spoken Chinese, but in written form. Um, and as such, it's easier to read. Japanese like easier things to read, just like the rest of us, <laughs> all right? Uh, anyway, um, so we're getting a, now Lin Shi Yi was a thoroughgoing Neo-Confucian. He wasn't a Buddhist, a believing Buddhist. Wu Shi Ga Shintu. He was a, a, a Li Jia, uh, you know, Dao Li, you know, Taoist, or not a Taoist, a, a, a belief in the Confucian Tao, but the expanded Neo Confucian Tao, um, not the original pre modern or pre um, imperial era of classical Confucianism. However, by the 13th century, especially toward the, the end of the Southern Song, the, the dominant discourse was. Buddhism, especially Chan or Zen Buddhism in China. Intellectuals across the whole spectrum of Chinese intellectual life would discuss things that have nothing to do with Buddhism, but they would do it in terms of Buddhist terminology and Buddhist concepts and even Buddhist ways of organizing argument. Uh, one prominent example of this is uh, Yen Yu's Tsanglang Shihua, the, 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 the poetry talks, the great theoretical, um, uh, uh, most influential work on Chinese poetics of, uh, of that period, which in effect created the whole uh, archaist or fugu movement of the Yuan, Ming, and Qing periods. It all can be traced back to Yen Yu's Tsanglang Shihua, and he discussed things thoroughly in terms of Chan Buddhism but he wasn't a Buddhist. He was, a, he was actually a second generation in direct lineage from Zhu Xi himself. Okay. Now, Lin Xi Yi's uh, uh, commentary is being translated by uh, my good friend, uh, Chiu Pei Pei, who is professor of Chinese and Japanese at Vassar College. Uh, she has been uh, distracted by a lot of other duties it's a, um, a superb undergraduate liberal arts um, college, so she does an awful lot of teaching. Um, and she's also been very interested in some other very, very important topics, uh, comfort women. She's written a very important work on exposing uh, that terrible history. But anyway, Pepe is herself preparing a complete translation and an integrated new translation with the classic itself of the Lin Shi Yi commentary, which is going to be very different than mine, as because we're, he's going to integrate uh, her translation of the Zhuangzi with the commentary, just the way I did with Guo Xiang. And they read it, in, in the, especially the philosophical passages, very, very differently. But can Taoist texts be understood in Buddhist terms? One opinion worth noting is from the great translator of Indian Buddhist text, Zhang, the you know, uh, Tang Dynasty figure, who ordered by Emperor Wen, that is Taizong, to translate the Lao Tzu into Sanskrit. Do you know about this? This is a peculiar piece of, of cultural history. Well, uh, it, it failed. They gave up on it eventually. Um, but I've got the original Chinese text up there. Since the original, or since the essential principles of Buddhism and Taoism are innately incompatible, how can one use the principle of Buddhism to explain those of Taoism? Nevertheless, discussion. Now he's discussed all his colleagues he's been working with. And he is a great translator. He, you know, everyone you know, in Buddhist studies knows about him, of course. Nevertheless, discussion went back and forth for days on end, thoroughly scrutinizing everything, but what was said was vague and vacuous without supporting evidence. Some kept referring to the Siddhi, the Arya Satya, the Four Noble Truths, and the Siguo, the Fala Satya, the Four Fruits, the Effects, while others kept referring to the Wuda. Now here it is on the Chinese, on the Taoist side, and Wu Dai, freedom from dependency. Xuanzang then said, Masters, why do you indulge in such debate is beyond my understanding. And then he goes on to say, for the Four Noble Truths and the Four Effects, which you cited earlier, Taoist scriptures are not clarified by them, so why go on with such drivel? 
and then and then he goes on. I, I'm not going to read it all. Uh, however, the conclusion is, um, it, it, someone argue, argued against it. Tsai Huang argued against it. He said Sun Zhao, the famous fourth, uh, fifth century, early fifth century, late fourth century thinker, composed his treatises. He copiously cited the Laozi and Zhuangzi, and he said that was because he was so familiar with them that he could recite them by heart. Since the sayings of, re of Buddhism so resemble, but they're not the same, so resemble Zhuangzi, for he was so moved. All right, so resemble those of Taoism. Why should not the thought? And Shanzang said, when Buddhist teachings first began here, its profound scriptures were still unavailable. So the arcane principles, this is the Xuan, the arcane that I'm talking about, the Xuan principles uh, spoken by Master Lao resonated somewhat with those of receptive mind who entirely seemed to have fallen into a trap from which they couldn't escape. This is why in the Zhao Lun, this is the treatise of Song Zhao and his preference to use them as analogous examples. However, such analogies do not mean that the same absolute limits are shared. So even, even there, it, it, people realize, this, especially the more astute, such as Shanzang, that they're not the same tradition, though they do share similarities. Anyway, extensive Taoist-Buddhist dialogues spend the ages with much mutual borrowing as each tried to interpret the other in its own continually mutable terms. Yeah, that's another problem. What terms mean in one era with one text, with one thinker, don't necessarily mean the same thing at another time with another thinker. They're mutable. Anyway, here are some people who have worked on these issues. Um, Frederica Alessandri um, did a dissertation, which was then published. Uh, the, uh, the dispute between Taoist, the Taoist and Buddhists in the Fo Dao Lun Hung of the great thinker Dao Xian, okay, the, the great monk. And she also has published a very interesting book very recently, the Tao Te Ching commentary of Chen Shuangying. Now, Chen Shuangying was a Taoist priest at the time of Shanzong, the high Tang of, of Li Bai and Du Fu, right? And um, um, uh, she did a, has done a wonderful um, um, uh, uh, analysis of, of how the, how the, how Chen Shuangying uh, developed uh, the, the thought of the Tao Te Ching into the discourse of his day, which was essentially Buddhist Madhyamaka thinking. He was very much influenced by Madhyamaka thinking. In fact, poor Brook Brook Zaporin thought that Chen Shangying was actually a Buddhist priest. And uh, 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 alas, we write sometimes dumb things and and introductions to our works. I did the same thing. I'm not going to tell you about that. You can find out that for yourself. Anyway, and then um, our colleague who has just left, he's flown down to UC Berkeley to give a lecture at UC Berkeley and, and to do something else in San Francisco, um, Tim Barrett. Uh, he has worked in this area of Taoist Buddhist um, uh, relations under the Tang in particular. And there's two of his works. And then a work that's even more detailed and more extensive is Christine Moliere, The Dip Buddhism and Taoism Face to Face. And I recommend those all to you. Now, Go Xian and Buddhism. Now, Go's impact on the introduction and early development of Buddhism in China was complex and profound, the principal conduit of which were, wasn't he, it was not Go himself. This didn't happen in his own day. He was busy surviving. I'm going to talk about the political, military, social uh, background in a moment. But the next two or three generations after the Chinese were chased out of North China by the Xianbi, the Xiongnu, you know, the, the tribes that took over the North, and, and the, they, uh, they fled south and founded in Jinling, at, 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 with, you know, Nanjing, the capital of the Southern Dynasties. Uh, that's when um, his thought uh, helped to uh, inspire, um, provide terminology for uh, 
and even categories of thought uh, with the growing um, um, uh, program of massive translation from Sanskrit and Prakrit into Chinese of the Buddhist of Buddhist texts. Now, this is dealt with by a number of people. I've list uh, various works that you're uh, encouraged to to look at. Um, it's nothing that I should go into here, but you can certainly read about it later. Now, sorry, this way. Now, one of the curious things is the close resemblance of certain things that appear in not only the Zhuangzi, but especially the Zhuangzi as interpreted by Guo Xiang. And this is one of them. And I think uh, it might be even obvious to those of you who know something about the Tetralemna. This is very much the same thing. Um, is it that things had a beginning? And Guo Xiang says, if there was a beginning, then there'll be an end, which implies neither. Right. For the, this is one big difference. And we had this talk about the end of, of, of Kalpas and the end, perhaps, of human existence, the end of the world and whatnot. There's none of this in philosophical Taoism. It's a steady state universe. The Tao always was there and it always will be. Right. Anyway, but he's asking the rhetorical question, is it that things had a beginning or is it that things never had a beginning? This is A or not A, right? And then it goes on. Is it that it was never so that things never had a beginning? And then he goes on. Is it that things really exist? Is it that things don't really exist? Is it that it has never been so that things don't really exist? And so on. This is, again, you know, uh, it's yes, no, neither yes nor no, and so forth. It's the petrolemma, not couched in exactly the same terms, but I think it's very, very similar. And this is one of those things that is similar, but not the same as, as um, uh, Nargajana's famous translation in the Madhyamaka Satra um, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, of, Kar, of Kumara Jiva, rather, is translation of Nargaja's Madhyamaka Karika. It's appended with notes, and, and this is all here. You know, the, the, the Siman or the Suju Fanbia, the Suju Fa, the Tetralemna, uh, in which, is, in which Narguna, Nar, Nargajana wishes to prove is the ir irrationality of existence or the falsity of reasoning, which is based upon logical principles, A equals A, and so forth. And the double refutation is called the middle path. And this is a very close um, approximation of, of Madhyamaka thinking you know, in, a in a kernel. Uh, however, we have to ask, uh, Guo Xiang, was Guo Xiang influenced by Buddhism? Did Guo Xiang influence Buddhism? Um, did Guo Xiang's thought, was it indigenous and independent or was it influenced by Buddhism or not? Or was something else involved? Was there a mutual you know, influence back and forth? Um, it just so happened that he lived at a time when Buddhism was really making an inroad into China at all levels. And especially at this period with intellectual um, thinkers um, uh, who were concerned with such questions. Um, my own feeling about all this is that it was an independent, um, because after all, what I was reading you before in the boldface, that was Zhuangzi's thought. And I'm pretty sure that that was already fixed in place by the third century BC, BCE. So long before Buddhism came to, to, to China. Now, I'm going to go on to something else. And I put this in because of the uh, interest of um, this conference that I'm now the tail end speaker um, at the very end, um, the concern for the environment. Um, 
ecology and so forth. Now, Taoism, uh, 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 along with Buddhism, was instrumental in developing a respect for nature. But you have to be careful about what you mean by nature. Do you mean nature as pastoral stewardship, which is essentially a farmer's world, or whether you mean wild, capital N nature, you know, untouched by human beings out there, that is a metaphor for pure, um, uncontaminated by human frailty and evil, um, all the bad things that human beings do, somehow there's a purity of nature outside humanity. Now there's two different kinds of nature in the Chinese tradition. And we have a very strong pastoral tradition in thinking and philosophical works and also especially in poetry uh, up through the third century uh, of the common era. Um, if you know something about the history of Chinese poetry, Tao Yanming is a great nature poet, but he's a pastoral nature poet. He's a farmer, essentially. He's interested in um, a symbiotic uh, farmer's relationship with the soil. He takes care of it, it takes care of him. You get it a, a couple of generations later, you get real landscape poetry that we think of as landscape poetry, wild nature out there on the frontier somewhere. And that's the poetry of, of Xielingyun, right? Where there's a transcendence involved. There's an awe. It's like the, the difference between pastoral uh, poetry of, of uh, Roman poets um, or uh, earlier 18th century English poets and then the great romantics that come in on the, at the end of the uh, 18th and are so prominent in the 19th century in the Western tradition where nature is becomes a, a metaphor or a, um, uh, a lens through which one can find divinity. Now this, this kind of stuff it, it happens in China as well. Uh, but here, this is a passage from chapter 12 called, it's the Tiandi chapter, and, it, and I call it, I refer to it as um, stewardship or practical stewardship. Um, uh, Zigong uh, travels. It's a, one, of, one of the, uh, uh, the Zhuangzi, the, the, the figures that appears in the Zhuangzi every once in a while. He travels south and he's traveling through Jin, and then he comes along a river and he notices a farmer and he's carrying a big jug of water from the river up to his field to water it. He's laboring, he's hauling this big jug of water. And so Zigong asks him, you know, uh, you know what a uh, well sweep is? And the farmer didn't, so explain it to me. So he explains it. <laughs> you know, a timber is shaped into a pole heavier at back and light in front, which picks up water just as you pull it up, but as fast as if it were overflowing on its own. It's called a well sweep. The gardener first got angry and then laughed. I heard from my teacher that someone who has a machine will surely have a machine thing, will have machine things to do, and someone who has machine things to do is sure to have a machine-like mind. When one harbors a machine-like mind in one's breast, his pure simplicity becomes impaired, and when one's pure simplicity is impaired, his spiritual life becomes unstable. Ones whose spiritual life is unstable won't be supported by the Tao. It's not that I don't know about it, I just would be ashamed to use it. Now that's the Zhuangzi. But look what Guo Xiang says. One who uses something only at the time it should be used does preserve his perfection of simplicity. This fellow in his desire to cultivate perfection of simplicity would embrace the one, meaning the Tao, by abiding by ancient precedent which misses the point entirely. And this brings out one important thing that, that Guo Xiang belabors throughout his commentary, that precedent rules, formulas left behind by sages are useless. The only way to do things and achieve perfection is to do them 
spontaneously, uh, unselfconsciously to remove um, all uh, impediment between self and other. All of this might sound like Buddhism in many places, but there's a big difference here. The Taoists weren't ever talking about benevolence or empathy or uh, doing good for others or salvation or any of that. All they were interested in was developing a perfectly unselfconscious, spontaneous uh, interaction with whatever they were doing. It was a kind of a very narrow, um, self-centered, but interestingly, without a self. In other words, you discard yourself because it's in the way. If your self, if your self includes self-consciousness, it's the wrong self. You've got to get rid of yourself in order to have a true self, which is a paradox, but then thinkers like this really like paradoxes, don't they? Now, nature in, uh, in Guo Xiang's drawings is all its manifestations is a metaphor for human thought and behavior, centering on spontaneous, unselfconscious stewardship of livelihood and environment. The setting for both the natural world and the human mind is thus pastoral. Nature managed in harmony with natural principles and not the grand, wild, pure nature uncontaminated by and transcendent to the human realm. The landscape of the soon to arrive with the Eastern Jin, that is one or two generations later, um, in the uh, later fourth and into the fifth century, the Taoist mystics and poets and the great landscape painters, beginning with the five dynasties in Northern Song in the 10th and 11th centuries. Now, these are, these are old works, but unlike the sciences, the humanities doesn't get better. We don't have cutting edges in the real humanities. There's really good stuff written a long time ago. And these are the best introductions still to this day to appreciating what landscape, how the, the, the growth of landscape in the Chinese tradition. It's John Frodsham, Landscape Poetry in China and Europe in the journal Comparative Literature from 1967. And he says, in purely Buddhist terms, the landscape is one of the three bodies of Buddha, the Dharmakaya or body of the law, hence the contemplation of landscape is a religious exercise, a fact which helps to explain why so many monasteries were built among mountain wilds. However, there were Taoist temples, which, is, which means literally observe. It means observe the, the changing, ever-shifting mists and winds and rain and sunlight and everything. It's a metaphor for the great workings of the Tao at large. And Xiaoling Yun um, is studied in particular uh, by my old friend, he passed away a few years ago, uh, Richard Mather, uh, Landscape Buddhism of the 5th Century Poet Xiaoling Yun in the Journal of Asian Studies from 1958, uh, where he says, the Chinese Buddhist poet seems rather to be impressed by negative qualities, the emptiness of vast spaces, the silence of unpeopled hillsides, the withdrawal from sordid events, it's an atmosphere favoring the quest for nirvana, in the perfect setting for monasteries and temples. Well, a lot of this can be said too for the, um, it's interesting that landscape poetry and uh, fu, uh, prose poems uh, of, of, of uh, uh, trips through the high mountains and the wilds uh, uh, come much earlier than actual the visual development of um, landscape elements in, in um, the tr tradition of painting. Now, um, Fan Quan, this is a um, late 10th, early 10th, uh, 11th century uh, painter. Um, this is one of my favorite paintings. It's an enormous painting. You see how big it is. It's almost seven feet tall. It's, it's three, two meters. Um, it's enormous. And I got this from, and I recommend this to anyone interested in the history of Chinese art, especially painting is a pure and remote view lectures by Jim Cahill. Um, and this is available um, at, at this website. All his lectures are there. And this is taken, they're wonderful illustrations too. Now, this meter high painting has down 
here at the at the bottom uh, at the bottom uh, left at bottom right this is a blow up of that era you see these tiny it's a mule train of travelers and then it's just inches high and this painting which is as tall as this uh, Jim um, traces uh, uh, among other things um, the relationship between the depiction of human figures and landscape elements even in uh, pre-imperial times back to uh, the late Joe the warring states period and you see uh, people in uh, paintings that are bigger than not only trees, but bigger than mountains. And then you gradually see the human beings smaller and the landscape elements bigger. Uh, in the Tang Dynasty, it's uh, the Dunhuang stuff. There's a lot of, of, of landscape elements, but they're still largely, uh, uh, Still largely um, uh, uh, depiction of human beings uh, doing various things, narrations of, of uh, illustrations of sutra stories, for instance. That's the, the very popular theme there. And then, but by the time you get to the late Five Dynasties era in the early Northern Song, you get a reversal. You get nature as the huge, overwhelming presence, and humanity reduced to tiny figures, almost. They're important to be, be there. They should be there. But, but the, the relationship among, among the two is, is important. Now, some of the thoughts that came to mind to flesh out this, I'm almost at the end of what I'm going to say, but that some thoughts that have come to me in the course of uh, watching and listening to the presentations of, of, of our colleagues the last couple of days. You know, I, I, I revisited the issue. What's the, really the difference between Taoist thought and say base, basic Taoist thought and basic Buddhist thought? There are so many similarities. Uh, one passage in the Zhuangzi immediately came to mind. That's the famous passage about the shadow and the penumbra. And that's the title of Book um, uh book, the, the uh, penumbra unbound, he calls it. Catchy title whatever it means, <laughs> uh, uh, that, that um, we have a shadow, okay? In fact, the shadow is interrogated by the penumbra, which is the, the haze around the, you know, the, almost a halo around shadows. There's a slightly um, secondary shadow. All right, well, they have a discussion, you know, well, you know, you know, you're, you're, you, you were standing a minute ago. Now you're sitting. Now you're, now you're lying down. Now you're standing up. You know what's going on? And he said, uh, I don't know. I just do it. Uh, and then it gets into this philosophical discussion of causality. And the notion of causality is rejected entirely. And this illustrates a, a point that Guo Xiang makes throughout his commentary. Nothing causes anything to happen. Nothing causes anything else. And that's a very odd idea, if you think about it. A rejection of causality completely. Well, that's what is really illustrated in this, I don't know, parable um, narration, this conversation between shadow and penumbra. Um, and it, and, and it says, at one point, uh, the shadow says, well, some people think that, you know, there's a light source, and then there's an object, and then there's a shadow. But that's not it at all. They're not, that doesn't cause it. Well, we know that it does in terms of modern physics. But what is it getting at? I, I talked to Brooke Zipporin about this um, one time, and we both settled on that it must be something like a catalyst. They have to be present together you know, in chemistry, it's two substances that don't interact with each other, but they have to be present for something to happen. But we weren't quite sure about all that. But I think I've got it now, thanks to this conference. That is, they're not caused, but they're not not caused. We really have a Madhyamaka solution. It's, it's not 
yes or no. It's both and yet neither. And I think that's, that, that is something that I probably would have incorporated into the translation if I had this thought at the time. Now it's too late. <laughs> There's going to be no revision of 828 pages or whatever it is. But anyway, I could go on in this um, uh, light for quite a while and rethinking various passages in the Zhuangzi that um, Madhyamaka thought you can see that there was a fertile ground for various important issues in Buddhism to take root in China because of Taoism. But that's not to say that there was some kind of um, technical or precise unilateral influence one way or the other. There was a fertile ground for Buddhist thought in native Chinese Taoist thought. And on that note, I think I'm going to stop and turn this over to my discussant. <laughs>